A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. The opioid and prescription drug problem in our schools and a different kind of park open to everybody in the cities. A survey of students in the Quad City area found that 10% of adolescents admit to misusing prescription drugs. It's another alarming statistic among many when you look at prescription drug abuse across our country, and it is foolish not to think it isn't in our schools as well. And joining us is Janet, rector of the Robert Young Center for Addiction, Daniel Joyner from Unity Point Health Trinity, part of the team behind the Prescription Drug Safety Program. It's across the country, but also in schools in the Quad City area, down to Galva, over to Muscatine, not mm -hmm. just the Quad City Correct. schools. Welcome both of you for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Janet, you let's talk about this is the second year of this program, the prescription drug safety program. Yes. Give me the genesis. Where did it come from? I'm going to turn this back okay, over to Daniel. Okay. <laughs> so this is really a, uh, a partnership between Unity Point Health and a company called Everfi, which is one of the leading uh, learning digital platforms in the country. Uh, to be a little bit more proactive about how we're addressing uh, prescription drug misuse and, uh, and substance abuse in our communities. Now, and when we're talking about prescription drug misuse, so often, Janet, we're talking about adults. Correct. Um, but that isn't the case. I mean, I was looking at more than 5,500 Americans, uh, American adults, misuse prescription drugs for the first time each day, 5,500. Of that, 1,700 are adolescents, mm -hmm. at least, every day. Every day. Yeah, when you think about the availability of prescription drugs in people's homes and they don't get rid of medications, it's readily available. It's uh, in schools uh, where it can be easily passed to other students. And it's viewed as not as dangerous. I was going to ask that because it just seems to be that it could be a more covert abuse is that yes. you take a pill here take a pill there mm -hmm. give a pill here give a pill there right and young people don't realize uh, or understand unless they've had some education uh, that using prescription drugs is just as dangerous as using marijuana alcohol heroin cocaine and the misuse obviously just becomes a cycle for people once they get stuck or addicted even as a young person that can lead to correct. so many different things that's correct and that's why you know this program is is geared towards kind of getting ahead of that curve before yeah. um, you know the conversation starts or those pills are being right. passed around can we catch them early enough to uh, make sure they understand the dangers around misuse of, of the drugs what did you find out from the first year of the program because you did you did you know you, you educated them, mm -hmm. you, you gave them uh, information on how they can lead their lives, but yeah. you also kind of monitored what they knew beforehand, what they knew afterwards. Yes, that's correct. So we did a pre-test and a post-test uh, after the education was, was done, and we found that 90% of the individuals that completed the course uh, felt like they had the skills necessary to refuse prescription drugs, which is huge. 77% uh, um, said that, uh, that they uh, felt like they were a part of the prevention piece in their communities and in, in their schools uh, to help stop misuse of prescription drug safety. That's a big deal as well. And 55% said they were better able to spot abuse as well. That's correct. That's a huge deal as well because, let's be honest, the peers may be able to spot it before someone else. That's correct. That's correct. And then the last piece uh, to the program is really looking at what resources locally and across the nation are available. So if they or someone they know is dealing with an abuse issue, uh, what resources they can tap into locally to help uh, manage their addiction. Is drug abuse or even prescription drug abuse, and I don't mean to separate the two as if they're totally different, sure. is it different among adolescents than it is for adults? I mean, are adolescents better able to hide it or do they make it more of a social thing? Is it something that they share with their friends? Is it a different way of addiction? Well, I think it depends on, on the person and sure. the adolescent, but a lot of times they are introduced at parties or at different functions where substances are available and may feel like they need to be part of the group and will try something. Um, 
is it different? The, the cycle of addiction is no different for an adolescent than it would be for an adult, but probably is more in a social setting mm -hmm. than it would be for, for an adult, the it introduction. In so many different ways, it always gets back to peer pressure. Yes. So let me get back to one, something we were talking about okay. before we started recording, is a social norms gap. It's how teens view their peers, and this is one of the things that you discuss in the program. I want to ask you about that, yes. but explain that concept. Well, peers have so much available, or young people have so much available to them nowadays through the internet, through uh, all the social media that they participate in regularly. So they have instant information on, on substances and, and different things. But in reality, if you take a look at the, the Iowa Youth Survey, which is done every two years in the state of Iowa, the 2018 results for Scott County show that it is not the case that students are, are using as many substances as they might feel are being used. And that's the thing that we're talking about when it comes to this gap. It's mm -hmm. perception as opposed to reality. Mm -hmm. and, and you're trying to tell these kids, no, this isn't reality. Yes. That's correct. And this program uh, takes a look at that. So it, it, it talks about the basics, uh, what the prescription drugs are, uh, what the impact they, that they can have on your body, uh, tips and tools that you can use to refuse prescription drugs if they're offered to you, and then as I mentioned before, the local resources available if they know of someone that's struggling with the addiction. Well, I hate to bring back something from the 1980s, but it almost is your way of saying you can just say no. That's correct. I mean, that's I mean, correct. It's, 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 it's it not that it's, that it's cool to say no, mm -hmm. but it is, it is something that is available to you. Yeah, if you think about uh, even when I, you know, when I was in elementary school, the D.A.R.E. programs that mm -hmm. were available in elementary school yeah, and yeah. middle school, uh, kind of taking a similar approach in, in that regard. And, and again, catching them early enough uh, before they're exposed to those type of parties and things where those drugs are offered, uh, allowing them to have that knowledge uh, to be able to make a more informed decision about what they do. Now, we were talking about statistics after the first year, and, and that is one metric on how to measure success mm -hmm. or whether or not you are actually getting through. But as you well know, statistics can be swung anyway. Mm -hmm. Kids can say exactly what they want, yeah. they think they want uh, you to hear. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think was the success last year? Well, I think the success was the, the pilot schools that we worked with, uh, knowing that uh, no matter what we do, you know, people uh, take in information differently. So this is just one more tool in the toolbox that, that students and schools can use uh, to really make an impact on a, on a child's life. Some may hear it uh, better from uh, testimonials that they hear from people who've experienced that uh, on a personal level, but uh, our goal is to reach more students uh, with this education and, and again be another touch point along the process. Well Janet Rector you're with Robert Young yes, so sir. often you get to see the end game of so much of this mm -hmm. when they're actually addicted and they're coming Correct. into your clinics for services. Yes. You though want to be more proactive in being out in the community. How is this helping yes. you do that? Uh, well along with Daniel uh, we run a prevention department through Robert Young Center in our Davenport CADS location and also mm -hmm. at New Horizons in Muscatine and our projects are for prevention it's birth to death so we work with all age groups whether it's going into the schools and doing evidence-based curriculum or being on a coalition or going to a workplace and talking to employers so our goal really is to prevent the onset of first use and delay misuse well and, and so what scares you the most from everything that you see right now all the education that you've given right now there's so much available drugs or addictive material right now I think it's important to start young uh, my kids have heard it uh, my kids are all adults but they have heard it all their lives and I at, when my son went to prom I said tell me five things that you're gonna say tonight to refuse substances when you're offered and I think it's important that the parents become involved and as well as the schools and teach them at a young age uh, what the expectations are and what the dangers are. What does that mean, a young age? Because my young age was much different than what the young age is now. <laughs> You're right. Uh, we do have curriculums that we are evidence-based that go from kindergarten through 12th grade. And what happens is when you're with a younger group, kindergartner, first, second, uh, maybe you have puppets and you talk about uh, good pill, bad pill. We have a board that shows how a, a pill might look like a Skittle and never to take something mm -hmm. unless it's from you know, a nurse and never to take unopened packages of, of anything, candy from a friend, because it might not be candy. But Daniel, this program just really seems to be geared specifically to students and, and really a lot to the peers, mm -hmm. to, to the group mentality. So what do you see as the biggest success? Uh, again, I think the biggest success is um, uh, the amount of students that we've been able to reach in the first year. 
Uh, so we've partnered uh, across the state of Iowa and Illinois into 48 schools, okay. uh, reached over 2,000 uh, students in those schools here locally, uh, about seven schools that we've reached out to, over 250 students and 115 uh, learning hours uh, that they've okay. gone through. And your goal was to actually increase the number of schools participating this school year. Mm -hmm. How is that going so far? Uh, we got some great news earlier this year uh, that Davenport Schools is integrating this into uh, their health classes for every ninth grader that goes through uh, health education, uh, they will take this course. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just one success that we've heard uh, and then hope to obviously ex continue to expand and hear more successes as well. Well, and as you said, it, it's not just a, a it's not just a one-year process. I mean, you're hoping correct. to follow some of these kids in future years. That's correct. So this isn't just a one-and-done uh, type of program, but really it's, it's about uh, educating them throughout uh, high school and then also yes. connecting them to other prevention resources in the community as well. One of the statistics that came out of the report from mm -hmm. the first year was 10% in the Quad City say they misused uh, a prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. Did that surprise you or do you think it's higher than that? Uh, I, I wouldn't think it was higher than that. Uh, just based off of statistics from the Iowa Youth Survey, uh, which is done in all the uh, Davenport, or not, excuse me, all of the Scott County schools, including parochial. Um, then let me throw another statistic yeah. at you, which came along with this report, and that was that 38% of the students that you surveyed, 38% have received prescriptions from doctors. In other words, they already are familiar somewhat with prescription Correct. drugs because they are getting it administered to them yes. correctly by a doctor. I think that what goes along with that is the education of the uh, medical field that we at CADS and Robert Young Center have been doing for quite some time. Uh, pain management can be done in many ways and uh, prescribing a narcotic to a teenager or uh, some sort of opioid is probably not going to be beneficial. They need it for a, a, maybe a short period of time and then they have the whole bottle left. Well, and that's, uh, Daniel, that's kind mm -hmm. of the statistic that really did jump out at me mm -hmm. is that 38% that have received prescription from doctors. Not saying it's, it's, it's wrong or anything, but it is prevalent in some ways. Mm -hmm. And to Jenna's point, it's about, it's about the education, right? So if they know uh, this pill you only take uh, over a five-day period, and to discard the rest properly, uh, that's what the education is about, to mm -hmm. not then pass that on to a, a peer or uh, someone who it, that drug isn't prescribed to. Well, I want to end this with, of course, you got to aim it towards the parents and also to the schools. Yes. So I'll let you do the parents, you do the schools. <laughs> if a school is interested, mm -hmm. how do they contact you? How do they take part? Yeah, if I could give my email out, that would be sure. uh, the best way to contact me is daniel.joiner, that's J-O-I-N-E-R, at unitypoint.org. And uh, I would be happy to work with uh, any school that's interested in Scott, Rock Island, Muscatine, and Henry County. And as you said, parents are so important, but once they leave the house, yes. they have to make good decisions. Hopefully, Correct. you instilled them. Yes, I think it's, a, it's essential for parents to be involved in their children's lives. And I see parents that are afraid to uh, comment to their children or their children uh, seem to have more power in, in households and I just really throw it back to the parents it's their responsibility to raise a healthy child and certainly we have uh, plenty of resources that we can help parents to educate them uh, through our prevention departments in both uh, Davenport and Muscatine. Janet Rector with yes. uh, Robert Young Center. Yes. Daniel Joyner with uh, Unity Point Health Trinity. Thank yes. you so much Thank for joining you. us. Quit changing the name of that <laughs> hospital. Uh, still to come, a park for all people. But first, Laura Adams hasn't given up on summer quite yet. She's got some great ideas for you to put on your calendar if you plan to go out and about. This is Out and About for September 9th through 15th. WQPT will be holding a screening of country music at the River Music Experience on September 12th from 6.30 to 9, win great country music prizes. Rob Wolf from American Pickers is holding Davenport Americana Auction and Car Show at the Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds September 12th through the 14th. The Quad City Rollers have a home game at the Eldridge Community Center on September 14th starting at 5.30, and it's time for the 7th Annual Belgian Fest at Stevens Park on September 15th from 12 to 6. September September 14th, check out the first annual Monarch Festival at the Wapsie River Education Center in Dixon, Iowa, or celebrate the 173rd anniversary of the founding of Bishop Hill on the 14th and 15th with all-day activities. Music on the Mississippi features Coupe de Ville at the Riverside Park on the 9th, and RME's Live at 5 features the Class of 82 on the 13th. Plus, Mercado on 5th continues to offer an outdoor night market in Moline on September 13th. 
The Speakeasy hosts the annual Laugh Hard Challenge on the 14th, a stand-up comedy contest, and auditions are being held for Aaron Power the Musical at Bethel Wesley United Methodist Church on September 14th from 2 to 4, while Ballet Quad Cities kicks off their new season with music moves at the Brunner Theater September 13th through 15th. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. Jason Carl is a Damport singer and songwriter who blends rock and folk music into his original recordings, and we caught up with him at a solo performance at Moline's Black Box Theater. Here's Jason Carl with Hearts and Faces. In the bitter cold, I thought of you Out in Colorado, living it up I've known so long what I've never been able to say And I'm holding my breath cause I believe in you But I wouldn't say it if it weren't the truth I know it's hard leaving, but that's the price you pay I add up what I've laid to waste The world can be a depressing place And I don't know if it's really round I just know it can't bring me down Cause it's only time and places And I've been sick of this place for a long time I recognize all the faces on the street and it's only hearts and faces And my head gets in the way of my heart sometimes I don't recognize the places in my dreams But it's only hearts and faces And the spaces in between The second time I noticed you I wish I could say I knew what to say But I don't get approached by many girls like you And looking back through those yesterdays Well, I don't regret a single thing well, That's a lie, but at least this much is true When I add up what I've laid to waste The world can be a depressing place And I don't know what's coming around I just know it can't bring me down Cause there's only time and places And I've been sick of this place for a long time Sometimes I don't recognize the places in my dreams But it's only hearts and faces And the spaces in between Jason Carl, the frontman of Jason Carl and the whole damn band, joining us on stage with Hearts and Faces. With the help of a lot of friends, Davenport has a new baseball diamond that is aptly named Miracle Field. It's a handicapped accessible baseball diamond, but really, it's a whole lot more. And joining us is the director of Davenport Parks and Recreation Department, Chad Dyson. Chad, thanks for joining us. Sure. Ribbon cutting last week, couldn't yep. have gone better. Great, great turnout, great weather. We're real proud. We're talking about a baseball field unlike any other in the area. Tell me what makes this one so special. So a Miracle Field is designed uh, to be an all-inclusive play field, uh, meaning that it has a port-and-play rubber surface. It, it removes 
a lot of those trip barriers and hazards that a normal ball field might have, including raised bases and other things. It really allows for uh, kids and adults with mobility issues to participate with their peers. Um, and it really truly is a field for all. Well, I mean, it's interesting because a lot of people may not even know about the Challenger League, yep. which has uh, handicapped children playing uh, softball, uh, uh, baseball, you know, on this diamond. Um, and it was interesting about one of the things that you don't really think about is that if you have a rain out on a regular field, it's even worse for a person who has handicaps. Correct. So, um, yeah, the Miracle Field takes that away as well. So when you look at a normal ball field with the dirt and the grass that retains water, becomes soft, uh, in this scenario, Miracle Field, the, the, the water runs off and it can be playable even moderately wet. Because you, know? you have uh, children with wheelchairs, yep. people who have you know, obvious accessibility problems. Exactly. So uh, it benefits both ways in that regard. Tell me about this first game. I mean, it, it, was, it was just a great night, great weather, great yeah. community support. Yeah, uh, we did the ribbon cutting, did the dedication, had a great turnout. Challenger League kicked off their fall league that night with some games. Uh, and, and what makes my job so rewarding is just the response and seeing the smiles on those kids' faces when they got to hit that field and play for the first time because they've been waiting so long to have that field of theirs. Um, Chief Sikorsky pitched a couple innings of the first game. Damn um, Police Chief, yeah. Sikorsky, right? So, uh, yeah, it was, it was a great just community, um, community event and a real win for the Quad Cities. Well, and as you well know, I mean, it, it, it was a period of time when, when park accessibility, they weren't all open to Correct. all people. But now I, I believe almost every, if not every park in Davenport has at least our wheelchair accessible, have, have appropriate parking. How important has it been for Davenport to open up the parks to all? Well, I, I think in general, uh, not only in Davenport, but in, in the park and recreation field as right. a whole across the country, ADA accessibility is critical. Um, and Davenport, uh, we've taken great steps to, to do that, to whether it's parking accommodations or creating um, accessible pathways or routes to access playgrounds within our parks. Um, we're still in the process of, of bringing everything up to speed. We have a pretty large system, but um, we have some good funding in place to make those those changes and, and bring everything to be more accessible to the, to the community. Now, tell me also about uh, one last thing in regard to Miracle Field is that it is a baseball diamond, but it is much more than that. Sure, and ours is a little bit different because we, we did, a, if you look in the outfield, it has a sort of a square kick out design uh, intentionally to be allowed to play other sports as well. So whether it's soccer, flag football, uh, wiffle ball, you know, other team sports, it's designed that way. So it can handle a multitude of different activities. Then when we're talking about uh, uh, inclusivity and, and, and better uh, parks and recreations for a handicap, you're still working on Gabe's inclusive playground. Um, and we've seen those popping up throughout the area. Really amazing facilities for people who have disabilities. Correct. And, and like the Miracle Field, Gabe's inclusive playground is a 100% inclusive playground now. That's different than just making, you know, accessibility modifications. This one is designed that all features of the playground are 100% accessible for kids with disabilities. And so where will it's not be just located inclusive. In? It's going to be, it's replacing the existing uh, playground at Vandeveer Park. Um, it is scheduled for spring installation. And you pick there because central location? Um, yeah, and I think the... And the park needed renovation. The, right, yeah. the existing playground needed to be replaced, um, and just the popularity of Vanderveer and the location, it was a good fit. Let's talk about the flood. Get me updated. How's Credit sure. Island doing? Because you had to repair the road. Yeah. Um, th um, that park is meant to flood. Sure. Let's be honest, uh, the, the flood at uh, Lockadam 15 is at 15 feet. Credit Island starts flooding far before that. Yeah, so we lose the causeway, or at least access to the island at 15 and a half. Um, we are still working through uh, a lot of debris removal. However, I'm excited to say that we do have the causeway, at least in a temporary fix, so the island is accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the next step is we're, we've just recently gone under contract to have the lodge cleaned. Um, so that will hopefully start next week. Um, and then crews are out just generally removing debris. We had a lot of sand buildup, sandbars. Sure. A couple of beaches that weren't on the island before. <laughs> are there now. Are there now. Um, so uh, the, the process uh, continues, um, but the good news is the island's open. 
um, and can be at least enjoyed by bikers and hikers and, and vehicles. So. Are you happy with how the lodge came out of this? Because this was the biggest test of a newly constructed building. Yeah, so um, after the fire and, and, and during the reconstruction, the, the uh, flood vents were installed. So right. this was the first sort of test of that system and it, it did its purpose. So uh, allowed, we didn't sustain any structural damage, any um, real issues short of just mud and sediment build up mm -hmm. a little bit and and that just needs to be cleaned out, uh, professionally cleaned out. Um, but yeah, we couldn't be more happy than uh, with how the events worked. It worked as it was supposed to. Exactly. What do you got for goals for next year? Because you're so, always upgrading, you're sure, always trying to improve. Sure. Uh, we have several projects on the high, uh, on the horizon. The, the, the first and most pressing one is the new park development in Jersey Farms. Um, so we're starting the design process on that and looking to have some construction hopefully in the spring. Um, we have a full range of activities. Our, our uh, fall and winter program guide just hit the streets, so mm -hmm. look for that. Um, and then some internal um, upgrades to River's Edge. Uh, we're gonna be doing some remodeling of the lobby and some things down there. We have a playground replacement scheduled for Jungie Park. So a whole lot of little projects going on here. And then yeah. the one other big thing I'd love to mention uh, that's been uh, very popular is our obstacle style playground course. Saw that. Just out at yep. Sunderbrook. Uh, would love anybody who hasn't had a chance to get out there and see that, go check it out. If you like um, climbing. Yeah, if, if you're a fan <laughs> of uh, American Ninja Warrior yeah, and there you, you want to train, this is definitely the play, play space for you. So, Chad Dyson, thank you so thank much you from so Denmark Park Parks and Recreation. Good to see you again. Yeah. WQPT has a commitment to the military families in the cities. We call it embracing the military, and it's time to get ready for a taste of Bavaria on the island. Rocktoberfest is set for September 27th at the Lockadam Lounge on the Rock Island Arsenal. There's German-style food and beer, live music, activities for the kids. It's also open to the public. A 2019 commemorative Stein is available to add to your collection. It starts at 3, once again, Friday, September 27th. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues of the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Whelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.